like, well, the Bible's been used for to be for racism. It's been used to discriminate. It's been used against interracial marriage. It's been used against slavery. I mean, to promote slavery, for slavery, and against slavery, thank God. Um, but the idea is, is, you know, these people think, well, no, no, this time it's different. When I'm, the people I'm standing up against are somehow different because they, you know, they're not as, they're, they're not as obvious. So I'm just thinking, like, in my mind, like, I mean, I was arguing with this guy, and he's like, you know, what if people, you know, my kids should be forced to look at people who dress and act weird and, and, and looking for attention. And I think he was meant like the, a gay pride parade, basically. And I said, oh, you mean like Halloween? I'm like, I kind of like Halloween. I said, I had to used to have this really awesome Batman costume, you know. And he was like, well, you're sidetracking what we're talking about. And, he's like, and I said, oh, okay. And like, you mean like punk rock kids, you know, and tattooed kids and goth kids and like kids who wear their pants real low. Like, those kind of kids, you know, they make all that, and he's like, well, you're sidetracking what we're talking about. I'm like, I'm not trying to sidetrack, I'm trying to make a point, and hopefully one you've seen by now. You know, it, it, it's, it's such a mistake for people to try to go after LGBTQ people. Even the most like crazy LGBTQ people who are like, I'm gonna go topless and the assless chaps and walk down the street. <laughs> Even that, because there's straight people you will find who have done that just as much, if not more, because there are a lot more heterosexuals in this world than there are gay folks who have done something very similar. Lady Godiva. Lady Godiva. <laughs> All sorts of people, you know, like. You know, they act as though somehow you have a corner on it. You know, I'm like, who do you, th you know? I don't think the, I think the porn industry is, is probably, you know, biggest money makers probably aren't LGBTQ pornography. You know, well, that might be lesbian pornography, but that's usually because men are looking at the lesbian pornography. Okay. This is the idea is, is that someone wants to act like someone has a corner on sin or something, you know. Um, and I hate it because I feel like it's a huge double standard. So we want to make these laws, and there's been this law that's recently been made in Indiana, which is completely unjust, and it's taken us way back in time. And I'm saddened by it, and I hope that the outcry that people are making right now will be heard, and they will governor will go back and veto the bill he signed. I don't know if you can veto a bill after you've signed it. I'm sure you can. I didn't watch that day of school rock. He says next week they're going to make an adjustment bill. Oh, they're going to make an adjustment bill? The Religious Freedom Amendment yeah. bill, Amendment to the bill? Yeah, I'm sure it's going to be really great. <laughs> um, the guys, just, uh, I don't get it. And this is another thing. Yeah, just to stay on the soapbox for a second. If you claim yourself a Christian, there are so many verses about not demanding your own way. <laughs> you know, not about taking control of things. You know, about being meek and kind. You know. But yet, we're the ones demanding that people do what we do. Now, I just think that, you know, they need to have a questionnaire at the bakeries that don't want to do these gay cakes for the heterosexual couples to make sure that they didn't live with each other before they moved in, before they came there, or they weren't divorced, or, you know, what, are you, what kind of sex do you guys have? Is there anything super freaky that we should know about? Um, you know, we, we just need a whole history here. Maybe we're going to get some medical records. and You know, because it's... You know, but they'll have no problem if, a, like, two really huge people come in and get a cake to get married. I'm just saying, you know, it's like, oh, they pick and choose what they want. Like, gluttony, eh, that's okay. We'll sell you 85 cakes. Just don't be gay, because that's kind of gross. <laughs> we don't like that. It's against our religious conviction. Um, you know, my, my thing to them is don't open a damn business. You know, if you want to be a heterosexist, because that's what it's called, you might want to think about what business you're going to be in. 
people are like, oh, well, it's tough. Well, you know what? I'm sure there were a lot of people back in the day who had a whites only restaurants that when it became everyone's equal, they were like, I don't want to open my restaurant to black people in my restaurant. I don't want a mixed restaurant. And they closed. Oh well, get over it. It sucks, but you know what? You suck too, so it's gone. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Like it's just so you could go, their business is gonna fall apart. Like, well, times are changing, and if they can't change with it, then they can't have a business. It's just, you know, welcome to quality. I mean, you know, if you want to get mad at something, you need to get mad at the 14th Amendment. You know, you need to get mad at, at, at things like that. That's where you should get mad because the 14th Amendment gives everyone says that marriage is a right for all of us. That's where, where, where Loving versus Virginia, for 14th Amendment made it clear. That was interracial stuff. So it's a right. If you don't want to follow the Constitution, then you don't have a business or you go somewhere else where there is not a Constitution like that. I'm sorry. Soapbox. I knew that that was going to be soapboxed in my Galatians again. Sermon. I can't stay away from that point, now, even though it would make more sense at another part of this talk. Okay, back to 24. Well, let's go to start with 23. Now, before faith came, we were imprisoned and guarded under the law. We were imprisoned and guarded under the law until faith would be revealed. Therefore, the law was our disciplinarian until Christ came, so that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer subject to a disciplinarian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. As many of, as you were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. Now let's look at this real quick. It's it's really this is really an interesting thing because you know the law was imprisoned us, you know, and and you gotta remember that Paul's defending himself too, but in his theology. And he's saying, you know, they, we were slaves to the law, we were imprisoned to the law, you know. And when you think of those words, imprisoned, you don't think of fun, or you don't think of peace, or you don't think of hope, or you don't think of grace. You don't think a whole lot of love. Um, you know, and Paul's talking that this is what the law was. You know, it was, we were somewhat, it was a bliss, disciplinarian, prison-like system. That we might be, but then Jesus came so that we might be justified by faith. Now, in Paul's eyes, he's saying we're justified because of the promise Abraham made, or that God made to Abraham, and Abraham was saved by faith 430 years before the law, which is arguable. Paul's playing pretty fast and loose with traditions here, and um, but that's how he feels, and he's saying, you know, Christ is the fulfillment of that law. So, faith and grace was predates law and will post-date law. To a disciplinary. For Christ Jesus through you are all children of God through faith and many, as many of you were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is no longer Jew, Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male and female. For all of you are one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ then you are Abraham's offsprings, heirs according to the promise. Now, last week, if you were here, you remembered we really went deep into um, Abraham and the promise that was made to Abraham and how Paul's uh, was very... <laughs> he was a cherry picker. He chose what exactly he wanted to and not. I mean, he skipped the whole part about the covenant and the with circumcision and all that stuff. Paul skips all that and he even says that, you know, it was a seed, not seeds, basically saying that when Abraham received the promise, it was only about Christ to come. But if you read the book within its actual, just read it. <laughs> you don't have to read it within context. If you just read it for faith value, you'll know that Abraham was being promised descendants, many, many people, not just one person, 
But Paul decides to make it just one person, which is very interesting. And it's okay because I think if you want certainty, I'm going to tell you what. The Bible's not the place you're going to find it. You know, if you want something perfect, something that doesn't have problems, well, I'm afraid the Bible's not that place. Now, I used to think that the Bible had no problems and that I could find certainty in it. And, and I defended it to the T until the point where I, from my own studies and my own reverence for the book, I realized this book isn't infallible. This is not a perfect book. There are issues with it. There are even issues with those who've written the books, I mean literally written the books, and there's issues with books that were claimed to be written by some that were not. If you read, for example, just the verse that we read about, there's neither male nor female nor Jew nor Gentile, nor slave nor free. And, and here what Paul's doing, Paul is tearing down a hierarchy system. He's also tearing down a Roman hierarchy system, but he's completely tearing down a hierarchy system of saying there's no value on race, there is no value on sexuality, there is no value on, on any social standings, because you're all one. In Christ you are one. You're all one. Now if you go and you read 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus, you will start to see that all of a sudden you're supposed to be married and you're supposed to have good kids and that the woman is below the man and all this kind of stuff. So what I see happening here is that Paul is, someone has seen what Paul is saying come to pass and not felt comfortable with it and written a couple books in his name and put them out there and the people who decided to put the canon together and put the whole book together were like, well, it sounds like Paul. You know, I don't think they did it particularly. But now that we have these like great orators and yes, uh, uh, scientists and uh, archaeologists and English professors <laughs> even, who have studied these books backward and forward and, and you know, philosophers and theologians are able to say, I mean, some, they can pinpoint like language change just within 30 years of Galatians being written. I mean, I mean, not Galatians, but the pastoral epistles, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, Titus, saying that, you know, Paul would have had to live 30 years beyond what we know he would have lived too in order to write these books. Now, I have another friend who believes that Paul just became a crotchety old man <laughs> and changed his mind. Um, but then we still have a problem then is how we've got Bible verses and books of people changing their mind. But that's okay because God also changed God's mind. Which often people say, well, God can't change God's mind. It's the same today, tomorrow, yesterday, and forever. You know, and you go, well, actually, there's a point in the Bible where it says God repents. Well, then God, how can God be perfect and just and holy and righteous and all that stuff? I'm like, ah, pfft. I don't know. I just know what I've read here that it says, and you're telling me you can't say that because of this book. I'm just telling you this, this book that you hold to such high esteem also says that the mind got changed, but for some reason you don't like that. You know, when I was talking about grace, and people were like, God's not just about grace. He's about, he, he hungers for justice. And their idea of justice isn't like everybody being equal. Their idea of justice is, is like, being punished and burned in eternity. Which seems like the exact opposite idea of the justice I just said. And so these, I, I honestly think that maybe this uh, Galatians um, 3 27 through 29 may be one of the most important verses in the Bible. Because it takes away separation, it takes away hierarchy. You know, women weren't, you know, women had no place in, in this time. You know, women didn't have, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Just like children didn't, they didn't have a status. status. There was no status. You know, you could own a woman. You could own a slave and you could own a woman and you could own a woman and a slave and a slave woman. 
and you could have sex with your slave women, and you could even be married to a slave woman. I mean, it was really crazy. Like, you could just have this whole thing. Not a big deal. And Paul's coming along and doing something completely radical. He is basically flipping over the table of this orthodox beliefs in the tradition of the people of the time. Not even outside of Christianity and some of those other faiths you may have been speaking of. You know, There were lots of faiths represented. But everyone kind of had this system of hierarchy and how it worked. And Paul comes along and says, nope, this isn't there. In Jesus, we're all one. And does that mean that when you walk around, everything's easier because of the color of your skin? Because you just go, hey, in Jesus, we're one. No, there's still struggles there. You know, if you're a woman, are you going to get paid less than a man? There's a good chance you will. You know, but those are human beings and these are people we're talking about. But in Christ, we are all one. And for some reason, the church doesn't seem to be able to grasp this either when it comes to LGBTQ brothers and sisters, that we are one. I think the idea of saying there is neither male nor female is such a huge idea that people will read over it fast, or they will just say, well, it was about hierarchy, and God, Jesus didn't think that men would get married and women would get married to each other. So it wasn't about that. No, it's saying God doesn't see gender. God doesn't see race. God doesn't see... The, you know, the president any different than he does the homeless kid who speaks to himself, you know, uh, a few blocks down the road that I see a lot. They're just not there. That's not how... And that's a beautiful message. You think, oh, that's a really beautiful message. Why don't we all join hands and sing Kumbaya together? You know, that's really groovy. It is cool and it is amazing, but unfortunately, people don't like it. We don't like it. Because if you've been discriminated against, like I know a lot of you in this room have been, you're also uncomfortable with the idea of me saying, we're all the same. I mean, I'm a white straight male. and You know, you're a lesbian woman. We're the same. We're equal. Like, Fuck you, we're not equal. I don't get paid as much as you. I don't know, you know. <laughs> but in Christ's eyes, we are equal. And that's what we've got to remember. And as followers of Christ, we should be treating people equally. And we should be able to have conversations with one another that maybe others would not be willing to have conversations with. We literally should be radical, revolutionary world changers. Paul was a radical. This is a system that we should learn to live outside of, but instead we fall into the trap every time. I watch my liberal Christian friends argue all the time about how they can out-liberal one another. <laughs> There's always a group that's being neglected. And you could get to the point where it's almost comical. You could just really get far down into, well, this group's not welcome. You know? Um human beings who are the size of action figures. Where are they? Why aren't they on it? point is, is we should be able to sit down and have conversations together where we don't have to see each other as the enemy and we don't have to try to outdo each other, but where we try to work together and change oppressive systems. I wish we could do that. You know, because I see the conservatives see a little bit more united on these issues. And then we seem divided on these issues as, as more left people who, who think a little bit maybe more progressively. And, um, and even we go like, I mean, going to events or, or writing books or seeing what people are doing. I mean, I just always feel like we haven't learned how to grasp the message of what Christ was saying. I mean, I mean what Paul was saying here. I mean, slave or free, let's think about that. I think how many people were real excited about Paul saying, there's no difference. What is the letter uh, that Paul writes? It's in the back. Is it Philemon? Where he's like talking to the slave owner. And he's like, I know you'll do the right thing. Like it's so passive aggressive, but basically he's basically sending his friend back saying like, I don't want you to make him a slave again. You know? It's really great. We did it here once at Revolution. I thought it was. I mean, I never realized I mean, that Paul was from Minnesota. 
but it makes sense. I think he was born in St. Paul. I think that's what they... I used to be Minneapolis, too. <laughs> um, all right, enough is enough. Um, this is why I, you know, why did MLK Jr. get so much from the Bible, you know? Not just from Gandhi, but from the Bible as well, not just from uh, Bainard Rustin. Um, both those guys are amazing. But he also got a lot of this from the Bible, and I think it's seen and hearing stuff like this. You know, we're, we're all Abraham's offsprings. You know, the Jewish folks at the time didn't like this because they're going like, wait a second, I'm circumcised, I've done everything, I've jumped through all the hoops. Now all you're telling me is these, 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 these Gauls, these Galatians, these Gentiles who've done none of this and they've worshipped like 15 gods and probably have orgies all the time and, and you know, and like to fight naked, you know, like because they're crazy. And you're telling me that these guys get it. Because remember earlier in Galatians, Paul didn't even want to sit with them because James's people came. You know, the disciples, early on in Galatians, and Paul had to rebuke Peter, the apostle, for saying, why are you doing this? Why are you staying separated? Are you trying to make Christ's death in vain? Are you trying to throw this all away? You know that you, a Jew by birth, you know that you can't earn your salvation. Why would you make these folks believe that? You know, Paul is calling for a radical equality. An equality that no one is comfortable with. Right. And the teachers at this time were definitely not. Because at least some of the people who were Gentiles were like, well, at least I can keep my woman in check. No, you can't. Well, at least I can treat my slave like shit. No, you can't. We're all equal in Christ. Are you going to be in Christ? Are you going to follow Christ? then we are all equal in Christ. No one likes that idea. Because either you're on the top and you're making the big bucks, or you've suffered a lot. And so we don't even like to necessarily always meet in the middle. Sorry. I'm just saying. This is hard stuff for me to swallow and hard stuff for me to deal with. But it's true, you know. Sometimes I feel like we get caught up in this, the hierarchy of suffering. I think for most of us lefties, you know, who suffered more, who suffered less, and and, and and I think we gotta, you know, kind of figure out a way where we can be one, be brothers and sisters in Christ, where we can be. But I don't know if that'll work or not. It probably won't, to be honest with you. But I think Paul had a good idea here. I think this is a, per, a very important verse that should be taken. I think if anything should be taken literally in the Bible, I think this one should be. But I doubt we'll ever get there um, because we, we, with you know, we've all been hurt. You know, and then there's all these people with power, and they don't want to give up their power, and they don't want to give up their influence, and they don't want to give up their their privilege. You know, and. Other folks who've had to be victims to that kind of stuff don't necessarily want to hang out with those folks and go like, eh, it's okay. <laughs> you know, I mean, all of us are kind of like, Ugh. Oh, But Paul thinks for some reason under Jesus we can do that. So that in itself is a miracle. Forget raising people from the dead or healing the blind. Just think about people who are under the cross, who believe they are Christ followers trying to live like this. But streets paved with gold and harps. Yeah, well, I mean, you only get the streets paved with gold and harps if you're just equally as nice to each other. <laughs> I think my streets would be paved with something else. Comic books and chocolate. <laughs> dark chocolate. Because I really like dark chocolate. I had some really dark chocolate last night. I'm very happy with it. All right, I, I'm going on too long. But let's end this thing. So a revolution, obviously, uh, not, not trying to talk about the church, a revolution was actually taking place in the world at this time. Um, good news, Paul's saying, we're no longer subject to, the discipline, uh, to a disciplinarian. Now, unfortunately for a lot of the church and a lot of people, they love disciplinarians. It puts you in power when you can take something away from someone or punish them. 
and the church uses this system. And it's very sad to me how the church has abused this system. Um, and Paul's saying that's not there. We are all one. Inclusive. Christianity includes all. We are all included. We are all children of God through faith, not belief. There is a difference. And that will be another sermon one day. Oh, this is this is another thing. Okay, so so we're all children of God. Okay, we're not separated by who we are. We're all one in Christ. Um, no one is better than no one. There's no hierarchy. Um, and, and, and 28 earlier on. It says there is no longer Jew or Greek, there is no longer slave or free, there is no longer male and female, for all of you are one in Christ Jesus. And the whole, this is, I think this is a beautiful thing, and, and somehow because I, I was thinking about uh, that when Jesus was crucified, and, and this verse in, my, in Matthew 27, 50 says, Then Jesus cry, cried again with a loud voice and breathed his last. All that, all at that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook, and the rocks were split. What I've always looked about the idea of the curtain being split is because there was nothing behind the curtain. It is though we were always called to be one. It was though we were never separated from God, but that we had created a giant curtain created the law and more law to put up between us and God. And then this thing, this curtain splits down the middle. And it's a beautiful image. It's a beautiful idea of saying there is no separation. A lot of people say that that means there's no more separation. But for me, I'm saying I almost says that you folks these ideas of separation are now over. People don't like that because they don't like to think that humans make mistakes in the Bible, who wrote the Bible, that they were somehow angelic and perfect. Um, so there was, you know, no hierarchy even between us and God. The hierarchy and all hierarchy at the time was torn down to say we aren't separated. Um, so I guess what I see here today and what I love about this verse is I find it to be a call to unity um, and to remind ourselves that it, it is us who makes the discriminations and I maybe and I'd say maybe rightly so when it comes to uh, Reminding people of equality, you know, not uh, it's us who makes these the distinctions of saying, okay, we see someone not making the idea of of equality. We see people not treating each other equally. So there might be times where we go, okay, we're going to see the dis the 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 the, 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 the distinctions uh, of 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 people who aren't treating each other equally, and we're going to say something. And we are going to treat ourselves and speak to ourselves when we realize that we are making distinctions between us and others. 
based on all sorts of ideas. And that, you know, so when it comes to us to remind ourselves of the importance of treating each other all the same, We do it. We do it for ourselves. But this is no. T this is a tall order, you know, because we'll always want separation. Paul here is saying there's no separation. We see the temple curtain tear. God says there's no separation. <laughs> I feel like God was saying there never was separation, but you continue to create separation. And um, so, if we want real revolution, if we really want to see the world changed. And we really want to make things different. We will learn how to work together, and not always look for the hierarchy. How we can be a part of the hierarchy, but how we can live out those words of no male, nor female, nor Jew, nor Gentile, nor slave, nor free.